From X-Men to X-Men First Class, from Spider-Man to The Amazing Spider-Man, from Howard the Duck to Judge Dredd, we're answering the burning question, something that hasn't been answered online in at least 15 or 20 minutes, putting to rest, ending the debate once and for all for at least the next 15 to 20 minutes. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the Top 10 Best Comic Book Movies. For this list, we reached out to you, the Toy Galaxy audience, and anyone who happened to stumble upon our questions strategically placed around social media. What do you think the best comic book movies are? And we left it at that. We didn't give you any guidelines as to whether it should be the most accurate page-to-screen translation, didn't require you to consider what the technical merits of the films were, no parameters to rank the longevity of the franchise or the score on Rotten Tomatoes. And we wanted to make sure we got this on the record before the release of Avengers Endgame because, more than likely, everything is going to be skewed by whatever the result of that film happens to be, for better or for worse. The decision was up to you what you thought best meant and how you chose to rank them. We took thousands of votes from hundreds of voters, compiled all the data using calculators and spreadsheets, this is the result of all that time, hard work, and public contribution. As a fan of both comic books and movies, I assure you that I have seen every movie on this list multiple times. I didn't even have to consult Wikipedia or do a rewatch or anything. Number 10 is 2017's Logan. Logan is the story of a surly limo driver who has malfunctioning knives that pop out of his hands. He and his bald friend are caretakers for an older bald man in a wheelchair who lives in a corn silo. One day a cyborg shows up and tries to kidnap a girl who doesn't speak who also has knives in her hands. This suggests that she might either be related to Logan or is from the same experiment that created knife-handed people in the first place. Logan, Charles the Wheelchair Man, and Little Girl Knife Hands go on a road trip to keep her away from the paramilitary troops trying to recapture her. They do a pretty good job for a while, even Eric LaSalle is impressed. But it all comes crashing down when another surlier Logan shows up and things just go sideways. Any plan they had in place up to this point is pretty much right out the window except for the part where they're trying not to get killed or kill anyone. They do manage to find their way to a mutant sanctuary run by kids, and I don't want to spoil the ending, but whether or not they make a sequel is purely a business decision because Logan has a healing factor and, given time, can come back from whatever. Number nine is 2012, The Avengers. Avengers was a milestone film. It was the first time that a bunch of classic Marvel heroes all appeared on screen together, or for most of them, at all. Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, Hawkeye, Hulk, Black Widow, Nick Fury, Agent Hill, Phil Coulson. This movie is the story of them coming together as a team to fight off an alien invasion that is being led by Thor's brother. Thor's half-brother, Loki, who's not an alien but has alien connections. That is, associates who are aliens who can hook him up with the aliens and weapons he needs to conduct a mass alien invasion of New York City. The real thrill is Hulk, who up to this point had been a franchise in disarray, and both the producers and the audiences knew that the whole thing hung on whether or not that guy was believable and entertaining. For me, I thought it was impossible, and I was happy to be proven wrong. This was the fourth Hulk in 34 years. Actually, that's not that bad. There's been like six Batmans in that time. But Hulk was straight up scary and also hilarious. I liked the way he punched the aliens and then yelled at Iron Man to wake him up after he died falling from outer space. Number eight is 1994, The Crow. The Crow is the story of a zombie with a pet bird who dresses up like an existentially tortured mime to exact his revenge on the people who killed his girlfriend and also him before he can finally rest and just be regular dead. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> Lots of classic moments in this one, like the scene of a giant firebird drawing on the ground after he killed a guy. The bird symbol is a crow, a symbol that he chose because his name is The Crow. There's a heck of a gunfight scene, depressing 90s music, a plucky little girl, and lots of rain despite an insistence that it can't rain all the time. Number seven is 2004 Spider-Man 2, the second of the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, and easily the peak of the franchise because it was all downhill after this. Some would even argue that the series peaked about halfway through this movie with everything being downhill after he stopped the train. There's definitely a train scene in this one where he saves an out of control train and the people who see him unmasked promise that they won't tell anyone. But I'm guessing Pete is going to keep an eye on them just in case because that's a few too many people knowing his secret identity. 
He does fight Dr. Octopus in this one, which was a really amazing character design at the time. Despite a lot of eyebrow raising, suspension of disbelief challenging CG effects, it still manages to land a timeless theme regarding the dangers of any kind of science and how many problems can ultimately be solved with enough punching. Number six is 1990s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh man, one of the most accurate page to screen translations in the history of page to screen translations. It looks and feels like they used the original black and white comic books as a storyboard for the movie, except for the fact that it's in color. Jim Henson's Creature Shop delivers the turtles and their master Splinter with their animatronic wonders. Each character was brought to life by suit actors teamed up with off-screen puppeteers manipulating the various lips, eyeballs, and cheeks. This movie starts with the hits and just keeps playing them all the way through. There's pizza, dudes, radical stuff, kawabunga-ing, ninja kicking, sake, I mean Oroku sake, California rolls, and talking rats making funny. It is a superhero storytelling experience, a fictional world unlike any other that doesn't also include some kind of Muppet. Number five is 2018 Avengers Infinity War. The third movie in the Avengers saga really ramps up the number of characters from the previous entry. Like it's trying to set some kind of record. Hey, movie, who are you trying to impress? We get it, you collected them all. Stop shoving it in our faces. Honestly, I can't even imagine what this movie would look like to someone who hadn't also watched the other movies introducing all of those other characters. And I certainly don't want to imagine sitting next to that person in the theater fielding all the questions. Who's that? What's her deal? Is he a good guy or a bad guy? How many of these people can fly? Are they friends? I thought they were friends. Is that Spider-Man? Why is Spider-Man a kid? Where's Captain America? While the movie is technically about the Avengers, it is actually about Thanos. And Thanos is a completely unsympathetic character unless you're not actually looking at the screen. Yeah, he's passionate. Yeah, he's driven. Yeah, he claims to be doing what's in the best interest of the universe. But come on, man, if the problem is resources, don't half the population double the resources, including the amount of land available. The Infinity Stones give you the power of a god. Make new planets, get rid of diseases, invent trees that sprout barbecued chicken. Literal, universal healthcare, trampolines for everyone. <laughs> Number four is 1978 Superman. The story of baby Kal-El sent to Earth by his parents just before the entire planet of Krypton was destroyed by disbelieving politicians. A bittersweet I told you so with no one laughing last. Discovered on Earth by parents who, despite his clear alien origins, raise him as a human with all the human flaws and guilt and doubt and humanity that he'll need to balance out those incredible powers and the isolation that will come with them. The tone of this film is so far ahead of its time, treating the mythology with the utmost seriousness of presentation. Superman is the kind of character that too many people have a hard time accepting because they cannot imagine a person so morally pure and morally consistent as to not be corrupted by the godlike powers that they have. You put yourself in his position and you say, yeah, no, that's not how that would work. Yeah, the effects aren't quite what they need to be to depict a comic book accurate superhero, especially by today's standards. But the writing and performances bring you into the world and ask you to trust them. Trust that this character is worth investing in, this character is worth believing in. Number three is 1989 Batman, half bat, half man, a creature of the night, an altruistic vampire sustaining himself on the blood of the guilty, or at least that's what he wants you to think he is. In reality, this Batman not only saved the city of Gotham from Jack Nicholson's Joker, but also single-handedly picked up and carried the entire genre of comic book films for a generation. No other comic book film had the same kind of impact, influence, and sheer volume of t-shirts produced. No other comic book film created more fans overnight. Stylish, cool, the best Batmobile design. Take your f***ing hands off that keyboard. It's not even open for debate. It ranks this high for its vision, for its performances. It ranks for its tone, its sense of environment. It's Gotham unlike any other Gotham depicted on the big screen. It proved that comic book movies could be a viable and important box office draw and genre, even if it would be another decade before the technology caught up with the kinds of stories that creators really wanted to tell. Number two is 2014's Captain America Winter Soldier. Steve Rogers, the only subject of a scientific experiment to create a super soldier, frozen since the 1940s, is revived in modern times and forced to battle against his friend Bucky, who was the subject of a Russian super soldier program, frozen since the 40s, revived in modern times. It would be unbelievable if it weren't so compellingly executed. 
Steve Rogers, Captain America, doesn't just fight his old best friend turned Russian asset, he fights just about everyone except his new friend, Sam the Falcon. He fights the guys in the elevator, he fights an airplane, he fights Black Widow, he fights Nick Fury, he fights the American government, he fights Batrock the Leaper, he fights Arnim Zola, he fights and wins against every single opponent except Bucky. And that one he kind of throws the match knowing that he already kind of won, so I'm gonna give it to him anyway. As much as Iron Man was the driving force behind a lot of what happened in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like its existence, Captain America has always been the heart and moral center. Cap is the one who keeps everything together and the one that everyone turns to when it all starts coming apart. And at number one, 2008 The Dark Knight, a Batman movie unlike any ever produced, heck, a superhero movie unlike any ever produced, and an astonishing feat to deliver such a fully developed interpretation of the mythology that is so completely different from the 1989 version that essentially put the genre on the map nearly 20 years earlier. With ninja training finally added to his origin story, this Batman movie established itself as the Batman of the era and had the box office to prove it. As of this writing, which was before Endgame hit theaters, The Dark Knight was still ranked as the number 10 highest grossing film of all time in the United States and number 26 worldwide, having been just passed by Captain Marvel. The Dark Knight has taken in over $1 billion, which is a fraction of what Bruce Wayne is actually worth, according to a Money Magazine article from 2015. Bruce is actually the third richest superhero at $9.2 billion. Marvel's version of Bruce Wayne, Tony Stark, is valued at $12.4 billion. And way out in front of everyone laughing at their pocket change, T'Challa the Black Panther rakes in over $90 trillion. But that's the thing about Bruce, about Batman, about the Dark Knight. The thing that is ultimately made most believable, the thing that we are inspired by and aspire to, is the thing that is least believable about it at all. That any of them cares about doing what is right because it is right, taking on crime one criminal at a time. There are lots of billionaires in the world right now, and not a single one of them has invested that money in the technology, education, and physical training to become a superhero, to fight for vigilante justice that is done in the name of what is good and right against the true evils of the world. Those are the 10 best comic book movies up to, but not including Avengers Endgame. The whole genre is at another shifting point where Marvel, DC, and everyone else try to figure out how to keep this gravy train rolling into the next decade. Is it possible to break out of the cycle of boom and bust, the cannibalization, the self-parody, and keep it fresh while producing compelling stories? All you and I can do is sit and watch to see what happens next. Thanks for watching. Please hit like and subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. Please share this video and let us know in the comments down below which of these films was your absolute favorite or if yours didn't quite make the list. I have to say that I was very impressed with the final list except for the inclusion of Spider-Man 2. I really have no idea how that movie got so many votes. I mean, it's fine. I'm not suggesting it's a bad movie per se, but top 10 before Thor Ragnarok? I don't know, man. Corn deserves better. <laughs> Cut.